Okay, I don't want to delay any more time, so we'll get started. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining the University of Washington Grand Rounds, Rheumatology Grand Rounds. A couple of reminders before we start the session. Um, the session is currently being recorded and will be posted on our website later. There will be a Q&A session at the end, so please add your questions in the Q&A feature and not in the chat box so it's easier to moderate. And now I'll let Dr. Singh introduce our speaker for today. Thanks so much, Danielle. Um, good morning, everybody. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Sparks today as our Grand Round speaker. He's an Associate Professor of Medicine at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. He did his residency at the Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, and then fellowship in the Division of Rheumatology, Inflammation and Immunity at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Dr. Sparks has been consistently funded by the RRF and NIH, Besides several seminal papers on RAILD, he has also done innovative work on the topics of COVID-19 and immune-related adverse events. Please join me today in welcoming him, and his talk today is entitled Risk Factors and Outcomes of Rheumatoid Arthritis Associated ILD. Um, Dr. Sparks, please take it away. All right, thanks so much, Namrata. Um... I'm, I'm happy to be here virtually. Um, as a plug, I will be there in person. I think it's the Northwest Rheumatism Society. That is right. In April. Yes. So I'm looking forward to meeting some of you in person and some of you over Zoom. And as an aside, I went to Wash U in St. Louis for residency. And I think half the people think I was at the University of Washington. So I'm glad to make an appearance finally. And you've had an incredible football season too, which isn't over yet. All right. And uh, so I'll start my show here. Um, feel free to interrupt and I'm hoping to have you know around 10 minutes worth of Q&A at the end. Um, so we'll take it from here. So this is my favorite topic, um, risk factors and outcomes of RAILD. Uh, and here are my disclosures and funding. Uh, so I first wanted to start off with ILD prevalence in rheumatic diseases. Obviously, this has been known to affect many rheumatic diseases for a while. And um, over recent years, it's um, caught wind in rheumatoid arthritis, if you will. Um, this has been a very hot topic in RA, and we'll go over some of the data there. But, um, you know, this is a big problem across all of rheumatology, um, particularly systemic sclerosis. This is from a recent meta-analysis. Um, so nearly half of patients with systemic sclerosis have ILD, um, a large proportion of patients with myositis and mixed connective tissue disease. And you can see here that RA had a pool of prevalence of 11% in this meta-analysis. And um, I'd be interested to see whether that's a high or low number. Certainly it's lower than some of the other diseases. But as you know, the uh, absolute number of RA patients is, is quite high, probably, you know, maybe as high as all the other categories put together. So 11% of a big denominator is a lot of people. Uh, and as we'll talk about later, you know, these are patients who are clinically diagnosed and certainly the subclinical version of RAILD is even a higher proportion. And, you know, how many of these people have unrecognized lung disease? Um, so we think this is a big problem just related to the prevalence and we'll talk more about the outcomes as well. Um, I thought I would start with some of the uh, ACR draft ILD screening guidelines um, you know, so this is not yet uh, peer reviewed. This is sort of a nice summary from the one pager. Um, so um, there is momentum growing for screening, and I would say it's probably not quite prime time for RA. Um, and, you know, probably we can learn a lot from systemic sclerosis where, you know, this is really standard of care to screen almost all the patients with systemic sclerosis. So to, so to see kind of what the evidence base was for systemic sclerosis and where RA has to go. Um, but certainly, I probably don't think all patients with RA need to be screened. And I'll mention I was part of the uh, guidelines on the lit review um, subcommittee. Um, so what was uh, in the pre-peer review is that not all RA patients need to be screened. You could consider it related, related to autoantibodies, smoking, older age at RA, onset high disease activity, male sex, and higher BMI. Um, and if you're interested, the other diseases listed below, particularly myositis with particular 
uh, antibody positivity, as well as MCTD with some other features. And how do you screen for RAILD? Well, um, as far as what the guidelines said uh, in green, conditional recommendations would be for either pulmonary function tests or high resolution CT chest. I'd say high resolution CT chest is really the gold standard now. It obviously gives you detailed anatomic anatomy. Um, you know, we found that the spirometry kind of lags behind some of the actual morphology changes that are seen on high resolution CT chest. And certainly once you find it, it goes down a different treatment algorithm on whether there's symptoms and the severity. Uh, interestingly, um, there's a lot of tests recommended against, including plain chest X-ray, six-minute walk test distance, ambulatory desaturation testing, bronchoscopy, and a strong recommendation against lung biopsy. Having said that, some of these tests can be useful as an adjunct, particularly in patients that are symptomatic or that you're uh, worried about infection or cancer, and certainly those often are on the differential. But uh, by and large, if we are really sure they have RILD, we're not really pursuing some of the more invasive testing. So bringing this back to sort of RA, and this is kind of why I got interested in this topic, because I started out uh, my career looking at RA risk factors. And um, as many of you know, this sort of mucosal paradigm of RA pathogenesis has um, also caught steam. And, um, you know, it seems that inhalants were particularly important as risk factors for RA. So this is sort of a paradigm that kind of bridges some of the pathogenesis to clinical outcomes. So obviously we all have a different set of genes. Some of them might put you at risk for RA. Some of them might put you at risk for ILD. And um, mucosal surfaces such as the airways and alveoli, um, probably in conjunction with environmental factors, smoking is sort of the low-hanging fruit that's been studied most, but probably other pollutants, other inhalants, and perhaps, you know, respiratory viruses could um, um, induce inflammation locally at these mucosal sites, actually form neoantigens that's catalyzed through the peptidyl arginine deaminase to form citrullination and sort of an aberrant neoantigen presentation through antigen presenting cells through the actual DR beta-1 uh, our HLA receptor to, to give to T cells, which then start this cascade of uh, uh, immune activation that eventually activates B cells to produce ACPA and other antibodies. Um, as you know, many patients will have sort of a uh, nonspecific phase with joint specificity and arthralgias, and at some point they become sort of polyarthritis and, uh, and come to our clinic. And the sort of school thinking was that uh, lung disease was a sort of late manifestation. Um, but actually you can imagine that if all of this sort of uh, immune perturbation is happening locally in the lungs, that this could actually cause lung damage and could present clinically as pulmonary diseases even prior to patients having joint symptoms. And certainly we we do see patients that have lung disease that precedes the arthritis as well. Um, so just sort of a clinical refresher of the alphabet soup that is uh, perpetually kind of confusing about RILD. Um, so within RILD, usual interstitial pneumonia or UIP is the most common subtype, which is the sort of prototypic fibrotic um, subtype. And that's probably around 60% of patients with RILD. A close second is nonspecific interstitial pneumonia or NSIP. This is typically thought to be inflammatory, probably around 30 to 40%. And there are two subtypes of this subtype, a cellular NSIP that's sort of a classic inflammatory uh, phenotype, and then a fibrotic uh, phenotype that can um, uh, sometimes be difficult to uh, distinguish between UIP. So you can already see that you'll need some experts involved related to radiology, pathology, pulmonary to help really subtype these patients. A smattering of other uh, relatively less common RALD subtypes, including DIP, RBILD, DAD, organizing pneumonia, and LIP. And obviously, these patients are complicated. You see them in clinic. You know, they're heavy smokers. Some of them have inhalant injury. Some of them also have concomitant GERD. Obviously, they're at risk of infection, particularly on immunosuppressants. These patients can get malignancy. They can also have what looks to be RA, but on, on, on under leaf have some antibodies that could think about overlap syndromes. So certainly this is a, something that needs a lot of uh, expertise, time and care to really phenotype patients well to know what you think you're treating. Um, I threw on some sort of representative 
images from CT scans. And these honestly were really obvious. Probably you wouldn't really need the multidisciplinary committee for these. So here's sort of a uh, advanced UIP pattern. You can see the um, um, honeycombing. Uh, you can see that the, the airways are being pulled with traction bronchiectasis. Um, so this is someone that's got a lot of architectural distortion and um, you know probably has had UIP for a while. Um, to contrast, this is NSIP, again, the more inflammatory phenotype that might have ground glass opacity, lower lobe volume loss, and reticular nodular opacities, uh, particularly uh, around the pleura, um, particularly the posterior pleura that's seen here. Uh, and you can imagine that these are probably have different pathogenesis in themselves and you know probably have different treatment targets that we'll touch upon at the end. Um, so one thing I think is very interesting about RA is that UIP is the predominant subtype. So this is actually um, a bit of an outlier compared to other rheumatic diseases. For example, systemic sclerosis, you can see on the second line here, is predominantly NSIP. Um, inflammatory mitositis, also in NSIP, and a lot of these patients have very uh, robust inflammatory phenotype with organizing pneumonia. Um, but you can see that really RA is really the one that's an outlier here related to UIP. And what is it about RA that kind of puts them on the path towards UIP? And that's part of what our uh, research group has been trying to figure out. Um, and the sort of anal analogous disease outside of rheumatology is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or IPF, which has one of the worst prognoses within um, all the ILDs. Um, but luckily, there are treatment targets that are emerging. So what got me down this path, I already told you about how some of the inhalants put people at risk for RA. We kind of looked at the other end of the spectrum, kind of looking at the, the ultimate outcomes related to RA mortality risk. So this, this were a large studies within the nurses' health study, uh, which is uh, around 250,000 women that have been followed prospectively since the mid-70s. And uh, most of what we've done in nurses' health studies prior to this was looking at uh, risk factors for incident RA. And this one looked at RA as the exposure and mortality as the outcome. So looking at total mortality here on the screen, you can see that RA does put you at risk for increased total mortality and that this is uh, more pronounced within the seropositive RA phenotype with a 51% increased risk, which is not terribly surprising given some of the medications we use and obviously um, disabilities that can occur um, with longstanding treated, untreated disease. But what was really striking was the cause-specific mortality analyses. So on the left is cardiovascular disease mortality. Certainly, this is still a really large public health problem. It's the number one cause of death for people with RA. Uh, but you can see here that there's a 45% increased risk compared to the general population, pretty similar across the uh, phenotypes. Um, however, the striking relative risk was in respiratory mortality. So these women had twofold increased risk for respiratory mortality, and it was really only the seropositive subtype that had the increased risk with nearly threefold increased mortality. Um, so this really set us down this path to try to disentangle this respiratory burden of RA. Um, this talk today is really going to focus on ILD, but as an aside, we also are very interested in uh, COPD, asthma, bronchiectasis, um, and other sort of, you know, dyspnea, uh, respiratory quality of life. Um, so there's probably more to this than just ILD. Some other epidemiologic studies that I think are worth highlighting. Um, so the Mayo Clinic, of course, has done some nice population-based studies within their cohort. Um, so this is sort of in the biologic era of people who had incident RA. There was 645 incident RA cases. Uh, They're basically looking to see the timing and prevalence of ILD. Um, so you can see here at time zero when RA was diagnosed that about 4% of patients already had ILD. So this is where these patients where the order was reversed, where they had ILD as a sort of first manifestation of RA and later developed uh, uh, arthritis. Uh, and one thing that's interesting is that uh, this steadily climbs throughout the entire RA disease course. So again, when I was a fellow, we kind of thought about this as someone that, you know, had RA for 20, 30 years, wasn't adherent to medications, or maybe it was pre-biologic era. But you can see here that even during the biologic era, there's a lot of people who have ILD um, diagnosed even in the early RA period. And the uh, cumulative incidence is striking. Uh, it was 15% cumulative incidence after 20 years of RA duration, which is nearly one in six patients. 
Um, and I think you guys would all agree that that's a, a fairly high number. Uh, and I'll mention these people all had clinical ILD, so it wasn't just sort of a CT abnormality. Some other data from uh, Denmark, again, during the biologic era, um, in the gray are prevalent patients with ILD, RILD, black are incident patients with RILD. And you can see that the prevalence is uh, increasing every single year. And actually at the end of the study in 2016, compared to 2004, um, the prevalence of RILD had nearly doubled. So um, within RA, obviously the biologics have been a really game changer to how we treat our patients. There's some refractory patients, but by and large, almost all outcomes are getting better. I think the one exception to that is RILD, where uh, it doesn't seem we've made a big dent in um, incidents, and certainly prevalence seems to be going up. Another study within market scan uh, with similar kind of results in a similar time period. Um, over here, the uh, black line is the prevalence and the gray line is the incidence. And again, you can see that the prevalence starts to rise around 2008. And by the end of the study in 2013 was, you know, almost twofold increase compared to 2004. Uh, this also highlighted a lot of the healthcare utilization and, um, you know, nearly three fourths of patients required an inpatient admission within five years of RILD incidence and over 170,000 per year per patient. And the mortality of these patients was 36%. Um, and certainly this prevalence is probably multifactorial. I would say that um, maybe a lot of it's related to increased surveillance. Obviously, it's a lot easier to get a CT scan nowadays. People are getting PET scans now. So some of these are diagnosed incident incidentally. Um, and maybe the patients are living longer uh, from other um, causes. You know, pe people who would have died earlier are now living long enough to get ILD is another option. And certainly this does this is happening in the biologic era. So you do wonder whether some of our medications could be contributing. Um, and we don't have great data about that, which we're working on. So another call to arms from the Mayo Clinic on the left here was an early study that was uh, published in 2010 by Bongartz et al. Um, so in this study, um, and you can see this is you know really pre-biologic era, even from the mid 50s to the mid 90s, followed up to 2006. Um, so they basically uh, found all the incident RALD cases, matched them to RA no ILD controls, and looked to see what survival was. Um, so you can see the really abysmal survival of RA ILD. The median was only 2.6 years uh, in that study. Uh, I'll mention there weren't a lot of CT scans back uh, when a lot of these patients were being diagnosed. So probably many patients were diagnosed sort of uh, later in their disease course, um, which might uh, make it appear that their survival is worsening. My lights just turned off. All right, now they're back on. Um, so there was a recent update to this analysis, kind of in a more contemporary follow-up period. So these are patients who were diagnosed between 1999 and 2014 and followed up to 2019. Um, so you do see the in the black line is, again, the RA no, ILD cases, um, that you do see a striking survival, um, worsened survival within these cases. However, the median survival is better. It's probably around seven to eight years now. And, you know, how much of this is related to improved treatment versus just earlier diagnosis is still to be determined. Um, so we also um, looked at outcomes within Medicare. Um, so this was a retrospective cohort study between 2008, 2017. And we uh, used validated definitions for both RA and RALD. So it's a very large data set. Um, so over 500,000 RA patients 2% had prevalent RILD at their first um, appearance in the database. Another 3% uh, developed incident RILD during median the three years of follow-up. Um, so overall, you know, this is a pretty stringent definition with these validated outcomes. So overall, there are about 5% that had or developed RILD. And probably not super surprising now to you is that um, mortality was a lot worse. So 39% of these patients died compared to 21% of those of, with RA, of RA without ILD in a hazard ratio of 1.66. It's also one of the first studies to look at cause-specific mortality in RA-ILD. As expected, um, most of this was due to respiratory mortality, but sort of a novel finding that is something else to worry about in these patients is that they also had elevated cancer mortality 
Um, this was adjusted for smoking, but not pack years. So certainly it could just be related to heavy smoking. But uh, we also wonder whether some of these could be precancerous or um, maybe um, you know early cancer that was uh, misdiagnosed. So it's another thing to think about in patients with our RALD. Um, so most of what I've told you so far is looking at RALD as a, uh, a sort of monolithic entity. Uh, as I at the beginning, we talked about all these subtypes that have a very different pathogenesis and different features. So um, we're veering into more epidemiology related to the subtypes. Um, so here is a nice study about UIP prognosis, uh, the patients with UIP in red and uh, NSIP in blue. You can see that the worst survival with UIP. And a very nice meta-analysis that Namrata Singh um, led, and I've cited quite a few times, I don't know if she's noticed, but uh, this was a meta-analysis looking at subtypes and that showed that uh, UIP had a 66% increased risk for mortality compared to other subtypes. So UIP is definitely something to worry about. As an aside, some of the subtypes are really uncommon, but can be have fulminant presentations, in particular diffuse alveolar damage. Um, so UIP and RALD is some, some patients to, to worry about. So now I'll talk in about some uh, risk factors for RALD. Uh, this is sort of a uh, condensed list, um, and most of these are either available to you or are of interest related to the topic. Uh, so the first one is male sex. Um, so male sex has been shown to be an RALD risk factor across many studies, um, and this has been referred to as the uh, sex paradox of RAILD, such that uh, uh, women are more likely to have RA, of course, but within RA, the men are more likely to develop RAILD. And this does not seem to be explained by occupational exposures or smoking. Um, so we're not exactly sure what it is about men that puts them at more risk. And it does seem that they're at risk for the UIP subtype as well. Um, we'll have a slide about this related to the MUC5B promoter variant, which has been very exciting for the field, the, only, the strongest genetic risk factor for RILD. Uh, a few lifestyle factors, uh, of course, smoking, and then we've also identified obesity. Comorbidities such as asthma and COPD are strongly associated with RILD, um, probably related to misclassification or misdiagnosis in people who haven't really uh, declared themselves yet. And then a, a bunch of RA-specific characteristics. And again, how this uh, fits into why patients are more likely to get UIP is still to be determined. Um, but older age at RA diagnosis, longer RA duration, high articular disease activity, higher inflammatory markers, including CRP, worse functional scores like MHAC, as well as um, high RA-related antibodies, rheumatoid factor, and ACPA. Um, and then we're also looking at sort of extended RA-related autoantibodies within our research study, such as carbamylated proteins, antibodies against peptidyl arginine deaminase, and antibodies against uh, MA, which the uh, University of Nebraska has been helping us with. So I'll give you some highlights, mostly related to our own studies here. Um, so the first I'll start with is the MUC5B promoter variant. Um, so as background, this has been known to be the strongest genetic risk factor for IPF. Uh, so there's a promoter outside of the coding region of the gene where the T risk allele is associated with higher expression of mucin 5B. This is only expressed at distal um, respiratory epithelial uh, cells and distal airways. Um, so the, the presence of this promoter variant was strongly associated with RALD with odds ratios of five compared to the general population and over three compared to RA no ILD. And it seems to be specifically associated with only the UIP subtype. So the figure I show here is honeycomb lung tissue with RALD that has overexpressed MUC5B. Our group has also associated the MUC5B promoter variant with ILD earlier in the RA disease course, as well as older onset RA, which is kind of interesting for a genetic factor because they usually make you um, present at a younger age. Um, as far as the reason for this, there's a lot of interest in it. And it does seem that this is very important in um, response to acute respiratory injuries. So for example, um, respiratory infections, including COVID, actually people with the promoter variant seem to have a shorter COVID course might be less likely to get admitted to the hospital. Um, we've also found that people with this promoter variant are uh, more likely to be smokers and have more heavy pack years. And the uh, 
reason might be that they don't get a lot of the negative side effects related to cough and mucus. They might only get the positive side effects. However, um, you know, uh, the remodeling this sort of over exuberant um, acute um, um, <clears throat> reaction to acute injuries uh, in the long term, it seems like this recruits uh, inflammatory cells and particularly fibroblasts that can cause lung fibrosis, and it seems to come on only earlier, only later in life. So to be determined, but this is you know certainly a very strong genetic risk factor for RAILD. Um, so now I'll tell you about some of our own studies. Um, so this is within the BRAS cohort, which stems to the Brigham RA sequential study, which is an ongoing registry for around 1,600 patients that have measures every six months. Um, so the nice thing is that they've had DAS 28s um, on a schedule every six months. And we, um, you know, what, what wasn't done through the registry was phenotyping them for RAILD. So that's what some of our grants help to support. And also it's a nice sort of epidemiologic data set with uh, time varying exposures and covariates. So we phenotype RAILD by actually doing a research review of every image of clinically indicated CT chest scans by at least two uh, attending chest radiologists. And these are classified into no RAILD sort of mild or early RILD, as well as clinically significant or later onset ILD. Um, so our main outcome is related to um, RILD presence, but we also have a subtype collected for uh, those analyses. Um, so this will illustrate um, one of our studies related to disease activity and incident RILD. And basically what we're doing is trying to merge the uh, sort of research follow-up in orange here, I'm sorry, the research follow-up in blue and the clinical follow-up in orange to try to, um, you know, the exposures basically come from the uh, research data and the outcomes come from clinical care. So in this study, we had finished the phenotyping up to April 2016, and basically we had find, found RILD cases that have occurred through clinical care, and basically the baseline, they had no prevalent RILD, and they had to have DAS-28 measured. So that was over 1,400 RILD patients. Uh, and you know, uh, every time point, the DAS-28 was changing, uh, and then we were looking forward to see who developed RAILD. So this was a nice, um, again, epidemiologic data set because you could look at just the first DAS, you could do a time average DAS, you could do a simple update, cumulative average. Uh, so many ways to kind of look for an association between the exposure and the outcome. Um, so here are the main results, really just dichotomizing DAS into remission or low versus moderate or high. Um, those in moderate or high had over a twofold increased risk for incident RAILD. This was adjusted for some of the accepted uh, RAILD risk factors. Um, looking in more granular detail, the four-level ordinal variable, you can see that there's a nice peep or trend across categories. In particular, the patients with high disease activity had over threefold increased risk for incident RAILD. And then looking at the continuous measure, for every point increase in the DAS-28, there's a 35% increased risk for RILD, which was uh, strongly statistically significant. Um, as an aside here, you're probably wondering about medications, and one that gets brought up a lot is methotrexate. I'll say as a fellow, I was also told that this could induce sort of fibrosis, and there was, you know, d digging into it more, there's you know, most of the literature is related to high-dose methotrexate given for cancer. Um, so um, there's been quite a bit of research on this topic recently. So in particular, the CERT study, which is a very large randomized trial between methotrexate and placebo among people who had cardiovascular disease, we also phenotyped them for methotrexate-induced pneumonitis. So the allergic version of hypersensitive pneumonitis um, can happen on methotrexate, we found that it happened in 0.3% of patients, uh, which is a very different phenotype than RAILD. Um, and now there's been at least three studies looking at methotrexate and incident RAILD without any increased risk. The ERAS and ERAN are British uh, databases. There's an international case control study, and we also looked in BRAS. You can actually see that all the odds ratios are uh, below one, so it's possible this could even uh, help prevent rheumatoid arthritis-associated ILD. Um, I don't have time to go into all of the other DMARDs. I'm sure this will come up with the Q&A. Um, there's relatively um, case reports for and against most other DMARDs and trials are needed. There was a really nice 
plenary presentation looking at ILD progression and TNF inhibitors uh, at the ACR this year. I will show one study that was published this year in JAMA Network Open uh, that's uh, provocative. So basically they, um, uh, I think, use market scan data to find all of the new users of biologics and then look forward in time to see who met a claims definition for ILD. So they had around 28,000 patients on um, biologic or targeted synthetic DMARDs. And actually the topacitinib group uh, compared to adalimumab actually had a lower hazard ratio of 0.3 for incident ILD. Um, so it does make you wonder whether JAK inhibitors could have some beneficial effect on ILD risk and progression. However, um, in the oral surveillance, which I'm sure we're all familiar with, which is really the dream RCT for drug safety within RA, you know, very large sample size, very large long follow-up. We had disease activity measured. It was blinded. Um, and actually, they in the supplement buried there, they actually did look for incident ILD. And they actually had uh, plenty of cases. Um, and there was no association between TOFA and uh ILD compared to TNF inhibitor. Um, so I kind of think that the jury's still out at least, but I'd probably believe these trial data more than the observational data. So back to our BRAS study, we've also looked at, uh, we've performed nested case control studies looking for RALD risk factors. Um, so in this study, we start with the case control status and we find incident RALD cases we match them to RA no ILD controls by age, sex, RA serial status, and RA duration. We then look at a preceding study visit to look to see what was measured to see whether those uh, predicted future onset of uh, case status, which is incident RA ILD. So on average, um, this was about 1.5 years before the clinical RA ILD onset. Uh, and we looked at smoking status, pack years, BMI, CRP, and MD hack in this study. Um, so probably the most novel finding within this study is actually looking at obesity. We found that patients with obesity had an over twofold increased odds for incident RALD compared to those in the normal range. Um, so that's perhaps another uh, population to worry about related to RALD. And then smoking, obviously there's a lot of data about smoking and ILD, uh, but within RALD, there's been relatively less related to smoking pack years. And what we found is that really, surprisingly, only the current smokers had a, a statistically significant odds ratio. So this does, you know, give you more more uh, fodder to tell your patients to quit smoking. The other thing is we found that the threshold of 30 pack years is seemed to be the inflection point for RA ILD risk um, with a you know marked odds ratio there. Um, so now we'll turn to another database just to give you a flavor of what's going on at, at, with our group. Um, so you can see that we've uh, phenotyped the BRAS study, which is you know great that we have those granular data, but we really like an external database for replication and also to increase our sample size. So the MGB Biobank um, is a really nice tool that we have here. Um, and basically, we're able to find RA patients through a natural language processing algorithm that uh, uh, looks at how many times, you know, RA was mentioned, as well as, you know, joint pain, synovitis, also takes into account billing codes, as well as uh, lab results and medications. And you can imagine with all those terms, you can find people who have a high PPV and high specificity for rheumatoid arthritis. Um, so here's a screenshot I took, I think, last week. At the moment, we have 144,000 people in the MGB Biobank. Um, as the name uh, uh, sounds, there's a lot of bank samples. So nearly 100,000 have bank samples. The other really cool thing is that they have run GWAS and whole exome sequencing on a lot of the patients. So over 65,000 patients have genomic data already measured. And they also do health surveys to get um, you know, health behaviors, family history, et cetera. So we do have, you know, granular data on smoking. So here's the studies that we're doing now within the MGB Biobank. So um, we actually use that algorithm just to find a patient that we then chart review to really confirm that they meet uh, RA, ILD, or sorry, RA uh, classification criteria. Um, we then, um, here are the subsets that have other types of data. So over 1,500 have genetic data. 
over 1,700 have serum, over 1,300 have plasma, and uh, 1,800 have DNA. Um, we also chart review all of these patients. So we have a large team to help out with this, but we uh, get a chart review variable related to RA data diagnosis. If they didn't fill out the survey, we also chart review their smoking status and pack years. Um, we also pull out their lab results from rheumatoid factor and ACPA. Uh, and if missing, we uh, chart review those as well. We also chart review for their RA disease activity. And the next slide tells you about how we phenotype them for RA related lung disease. Um, so within this list of 2,300 patients, we get a list of uh, people who have CT chest imaging or pathology. Um, so that would be um, a lung biopsy, BAL, or autopsy. We also perform an extensive medical record review to see whether or not they had clinically diagnosed RAILD. And then we also have the images of the radiology uh, CT scans reviewed by our research uh, radiologist to classify um, ILD. Um, when we actually used the criteria that was published in 2010 from that Bongard's paper. So these patients not only have imaging findings, they also have treating physician's diagnosis. Um, they also have um, PFT abnormalities and might even have uh, surgical findings that showed RALD. Um, so um, we're excited to do more studies in the MGB Biobank. Um, I'll just show you one here is that look, you know, most of what I'm talking about right now is looking at RALD risk. But obviously, once you have RALD, you worry about outcomes and how to monitor them. So um, we also pulled all the PFTs from all of the RALD cases, which is um, around 1,300 PFTs of uh, 186 cases. So 7.2 years of follow-up per patient. And we formed a group-based trajectory model based on all of the PFT data to put them into three groups related to change in FVC. Uh, the blue group here actually did a little better or, or were stabilized. And the green group had slow decline. And then the red group had more rapid decline. And we also looked to see how these were associated with outcomes. And you can see that they were really strongly associated with either lung transplant or ILD-related death. So the red group had an odds ratio of uh, nearly 18 for uh, these sort of poor outcomes. So, um, and obviously these patients have blood banked and uh, we're excited to track down the samples and send them off for antibody profiling and proteomics. Um, so here's uh, one of our studies we've done so far related to biomarkers of RA ILD. This was a fine specificity ACPA essay performed uh, at Bill Robinson's lab at Stanford. Uh, so some of you might be familiar with this. Um, this was within our BRAS study. We got 84 incident RALD cases and 233 RA no ILD controls. And we identified six novel autoantibodies that were um, associated with RALD. Uh, three of them were citrullinated, three were native, uh, and they were targeted against histones as well as filagrin. Um, and as you can probably uh, as you probably agree by now, we have a lot of data on these patients. So we look to see how these models performed uh, based on demographics, the MUC5B promoter variant, lifestyle factors, RA factors, and then combinations of these as well as the six biomarkers. And you can see that the uh, ROC curves have a really nice AUC. Um, we didn't have an external data set for replication for this study. So we did internal validation and the optimism corrected AUC was still uh, robust in an AUC of 0.84. We're also able to make a um, uh, scores based on these risk factors that perform very well, uh, had a over 80% sensitivity and 87% specificity for RILD. And uh, we're excited now to do external validation, which is ongoing with an NGB Biobank. Um, so here's some other ongoing biomarker studies. I don't have time to go through all the results here so that we have time for chat. Um, we've already touched upon rheumatoid factor and CCP. I showed you the fine specificity ACPA results. Uh, and actually, um, in January, we'll be measuring uh, PAD antibodies, carbamylated protein antibodies, and MA antibodies. Uh, we also have projects ongoing looking at rare coding variants of proteins on whole exome sequencing, um, we're also part of a consortium doing genome-wide association studies and also constructing polygenic risk scores to look for RALD risk. 
Um, there's been a lot of interest in proteomics, and uh, we do have KL6, MMP7, SPD measured, as well as uh, SomaScan, which is sort of a broad array that's exploratory, as well as Olink, which is another proteomic panel. Uh, and then we've also been recruiting patients um, prospectively and storing cells. So we're also excited to do transcriptomics on PBMCs and also tracking down lung tissue to do spatial transcriptomics. So um, a lot uh, is in the pipeline here and we're excited to keep moving forward. So I told you about the cohort analysis within BRAS. Um, we're now doing prospective lung phenotyping studies. So the BRAS lung prospective substudy um, is uh, led by Dr. Tracy Doyle, one of my closest collaborators in pulmonary here. And basically we invite people within BRAS to come in to get research measures of uh, lung health. So PFTs, HRCT, six minute walk tests, et cetera. And there's also a longitudinal component here where they get measures at baseline in two years and we're adding a year five visit as well. So here's the uh, first results from BRAS lung. Um, so basically the first 106 patients who had no known uh, parenchymal lung disease, and actually 44% had some parenchymal lung disease on the imaging. Uh, and again, these patients did not have symptoms. The associations were older age, lower DLCO or diffusion defect. Uh, and actually 36% of patients had emphysema and many never smokers. So we think that's sort of a, a, a novel uh, association to try to dig deeper into. Bronchiectasis was also quite common, and we found that 15% of patients had RAILD that was not recognized. Um, so some other collaborators had done um, some similar studies in two French RA cohorts, the ESPOIR and TRANSLATE2 studies. Um, so they found nearly 20% of RAILD patients, uh, cases um, that were subclinical. They also identified independent risk factors, including the MUC5B promoter variant, male sex, older age at RA onset, and higher disease activity with very nice AUCs with these four factors. Um, and I really uh, like the way that this uh, shows the gradation of risk. So to orient you, there's DAS28 in three categories. There's also male, female on the columns. And on the rows are the age at RA, basically kind of young, middle age, older age, and then stratified by the MUC5B promoter variant, present or absent. And you can see that uh, people on the, the top left have few or none of these risk factors and relatively few of them had subclinical RALD on the screening CT. So for example, if you had none of those risk factors, you only had 2% risk of having subclinical RALD on a scan. Conversely, people on the bottom right have many of these risk factors in fact, people in this very corner here had all four of the risk factors, and 95% of them had subclinical RALD on the uh, scans. Um, so you could imagine this is a way to risk stratify, and these factors besides the MUC5B are uh, relatively easy to obtain. Uh, so you could imagine, you know, not being worried about people here in the green, maybe thinking about screening people here on, in the red and orange, uh, and then, you know, there's an intermediate category as well. Um, so I'll close with the COPD gene study, which is um, had been funded by NHLBI, and NIAMS has now funded us to look for RA biomarkers and outcomes within this study. So this has a, it's a very unique cohort of uh, over 10,000 current or former smokers at 21 sites in the U.S. Um, so everyone's a smoker here, either current or past, and have at least 10 pack years. They're they're interested in COPD, but not everyone has COPD. It's basically a smoker cohort. They did exclude people with known ILD or bronchiectasis. So um, it's a kind of a nice data set to look for subclinical ILD. Um, so all these patients had high resolution CT chest, uh, surveys, barometry, and as the name implies, lots of omics that we're excited to delve into. Um, and you, you can also imagine that there's a fairly high mortality rate um, and uh, they have lengthy follow-up as well. So it's a, ni a nice study to investigate these issues. So believe it or not, all 10,000 scans were read by multiple people for the presence or absence of interstitial lung abnormalities. We call this sequential reader method where at least two, two radiologists look at each scan. If there's a discrepancy, a third breaks the tie. Um, and within RA, if you find these interstitial lung abnormalities, it's often termed preclinical ILD or subclinical ILD because we know that these patients are at risk for progressing. So here's a recent paper led by Dr. Gregory McDermott and our group who's funded by the RRF. Uh, 
uh, to study RAILD. And you can see within COPD genes, 17% of RA patients had um, preclinical ILD compared to only 5% in the comparator cohort. And actually half of those with the subclinical ILD and RA were fibrotic. So you can see the odds ratio for interstitial lung abnormalities was over fourfold increased risk for RA and over eightfold increase for the fibrotic subtype. Um, and actually, um, presence of interstitial lung abnormalities were associated with mortality in this data set, which has never been seen before within RA. So you can see that having uh, interstitial lung abnormalities or being indeterminate for it had over a twofold increased risk for mortality compared to either RA patients without interstitial lung abnormalities or the non-RA comparators. Uh, another really cool thing is that all of these images had quantitative CT uh, performed on that. So this is a machine learning derived scoring of the lung parenchyma. Uh, and basically all of the um, um, voxels or 3D pixels are used to, um, the computer uses them to categorize them into either normal, interstitial, or emphysema. Uh, and the interstitial is subclassified into different features. So here's an example here from a previous study. Uh, basically, the computer recognized all the areas in blue as normal lung parenchyma, the ones in yellow as bronchiectatic and airways, uh, and light yellow um, um, honeycombing. Uh, and it can also quantify this. So it basically uses all of the scans to both classify some and standardize to the lung volume. Um, which obviously gives you a lot more granularity rather than just presence or absence, uh, and also can find sort of subtle, subtle abnormalities that may be hard for uh, people to do, and obviously can scale this up to read, you know, hundreds, thousands of scans that are going to really take a long time to do manually. So here's a, a recent publication using the QCT within COPD gene, and we found all the RA cases within that data set and compared them to comparators. Uh, sorry, the uh, alignment's off here a little bit. So there's less normal lung within RA. There's also more interstitial lung. Uh, and interestingly, the reticular subtype is really what drove most of that. Um, and there were relatively similar type um, quantities of emphysema, although there might be a trend towards more in RA cases. Um, and so we also... Um, use the QCT to dichotomize whether these features were present or absent. And I'm just showing you one of the results related to emphysema, which was extremely striking. So basically, um, people who are in the fourth quartile of emphysema and also had RA are the people in red. Uh, the people in brown are the non-RA with uh, high emphysema. And then the green and blue are um, RA or non-RA without emphysema. Those are basically quartiles one through three. Uh, and this is a novel finding that hadn't been appreciated before. Um, you can see that the RA uh, patients with emphysema have a really impressive mortality. Actually, nearly 80% of them died within 10 years of follow-up. Uh, and this was adjusted for smoking status and pack years. Um, and there was also a statistically significant interaction between RA and emphysema status and mortality. So uh, this is another thing to worry about within um, RA patients. So I'll finish on some ongoing studies, and then we can have some uh, discussion. So this is an ongoing study called SAIL-RA um, that's just funded by NIH. So there's five sites. There's one at Brigham, MGH, University of Michigan, University of Colorado, and University of Nebraska. We're uh, enrolling people with new onset RA um, to get, uh, they get study visits every six months, including HRCT and PFTs. Um, and actually, we're very proud of our logo. Actually, the cells are lungs, and those are lung fissures. So each lung, there's there's three lobes on the right lung and two on the left. And actually, the whole is a uh, inflamed joint with synovitis. Um, so we're excited to do the sequential reader method and QCT on the CT scans, looking at uh, articular inflammation, autoantibodies, as well as other risk factors associated with presence and progression of subclinical RILD. And then a, a recent study that just launched, actually we just activated last week, called Anchor RA. Uh, this is sponsored by Peringer Ingelheim, and this is enrolling 1,200 RA patients for a screening study in six countries and 30 sites that I'm the overall PI on. And these patients will get HRCT, PFTs, a subset will get lung ultrasound. Um, 
And to enroll, you have to have at least two ILD risk factors, autoantibody, non-articular RA manifestation, cigarette smoking, male sex, older age, and high RA disease activity. Uh, the reason we listed those like this is that it actually spells out ANCHOR. So a nice um, acronym, I think, to remember the ILD risk factors within RA. So um, I'll close here and I look forward to your Q&A, but hopefully you agree there's a high prevalence of ILD, there's heterogeneity in subtypes, that this is uh, associated with worsened survival. Um, and luckily we've made, a, there's been a lot of progress in understanding the pathogenesis and under, under identifying risk factors. And uh, we're excited to integrate quantitative CT and other omics with clinical data to help to uh, diagnose these patients early and to monitor and treat them appropriately. And uh, of course, I'd like to thank our research group here that is pictured. So I will stop there. I will stop sharing. Wow, that was amazing. Uh, Jeff, oh, thank you, Nomrata. That's a lifetime's worth, and you're just getting started. I'm oh, yeah. I'm so impressed. Um, yeah, we, we have one question, and please, um, I would encourage everybody who would like to ask questions to start putting their questions in the chat. So let me start with this one. Um, one of uh, Thank you for your interesting, informative presentation. In your BRAS study, what was the concordance among two to three radiologists in diagnosing early ILD? Also, what is prevalence of early ILD in healthy population? Concerns about false positive diagnosis of ILD in screening larger population, especially by radiologists who are not experts in pulmonary disease. Uh, those are great questions. Um, the concordance, I'll say that we have our radiologists fill out a standardized form um, and you know some of the variables like ILD presence or absence the concordance is really quite high, um, but some of the other variables like, you know, nodules and ground glass, you know, those are a little less high. So um, we we really want a deep data set. So we typically do have a third reviewer break ties, but usually on some of the variables that aren't, um, are, you know, you would expect there to be some subtle differences. So uh, I don't know off the top of my head, but the ILD presence or absence is fairly high. Um, the second part, I believe, was about prevalence of ILD in the general population. That's a good question as well. So I told you, uh, I showed you the data within smokers, which isn't the general population, but that was, I think, 5%. Um, typically, it's quoted between 1% to 2%, and obviously, it varies quite a bit related with age. Um, age 60 is really the kind of number that most people quote where we kind of worry about ILD. Um, so I think it's a bit higher once you surpass that. And as you probably know, there's a lot of interest in ILD as like a marker of early aging and telomere related um, diseases. And Namrata, there's a lot of opportunity here with sort of uh, aging populations if you're interested. So, um, but it is kind of interesting that uh, uh, you know, particularly IPF and UIP, younger populations do not seem to get that much. Hopefully mm -hmm. that answered the question. I yeah, think there's a third you. part about overdiagnosis. Yeah, concerns about radiologists, you know, trying to um, diagnose and then false positive because they are not necessarily experts in pulmonary disease. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, I think that's something to weigh carefully. I didn't go into detail about it in this presentation, but, you know, uh, we are thinking about, you know, testing the clinical utility of screening. For the most part, I really talked about kind of the efficacy part, which is related to, you know, once you find someone who has it, you know, how are they related to outcomes? But on the other hand, I think it's obviously, you really want this to be accurate. You want to minimize false um, positives. Uh, and then you also need to think about some of the other consequences, particularly ionizing radiation. You know, obviously you wouldn't radiate someone who's pregnant, but you know, it is extra radiation than they would get otherwise. Um, and there's a, a modest risk that's been established with that. Uh, and then the incidental findings, you know, finding nodules, finding masses, and um, you know, obviously that causes anxiety and, you know, leads to further testing and those can have downstream consequences too. So these are definitely all top of mind and um, we have active studies in all of those. But 
and I, I do think it's not necessarily quite ready for prime time related to that too. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, I have a um, question from Dr. Venner, who's our scleroderma expert here. Um, excellent uh, talk again, thank you. And in sale RA, you mentioned use of ultrasound for ILD diagnosis. I think that's a great pickup. What do you anticipate will be the role of ultrasound? Um, that's a, you know, I think I'm interested in everyone's thoughts here as well. Um, you know, compared to when I was a fellow, I think musculoskeletal ultrasound has just completely, um, you know, I think it's almost everyone seems like they're getting trained in musculoskeletal ultrasound. And, um, you know, it, it is nice that it's available. And I think it is an option to, you know, once people are proficient in, our, in musculoskeletal ultrasound to think about whether lung ultrasound is also something to mm -hmm. become proficient in. So I think it's an opportunity. I think at the moment, really only a, a few niche radi rheumatologists are doing it. For the most part, pulmonary is doing it. And then obviously radiology. So I think there is an opportunity. You know, I think if you're on the fence about whether they should be screened and they're in your office, it's probably an opportunity. Um, so we are integrating it into our research studies. Um, and particularly the anchor RA study is probably going to be the largest RA ILD uh, lung ultrasound study that will ever be performed. Uh, mm -hmm. And everyone will have the gold standard done as well on the same day at the same time. So um, hopefully we'll have sort of acceptable performance characteristics there. I think for the most part, it would be used as sort of a triage system onto you know, who should go forward to get the CT scan. Mm -hmm. Sounds wonderful. Um, next question I have from Dr. Gardner, um, who's, who, who is the uh, rheumatologist participating in our room pulmonary clinic, combined multidisciplinary clinic. He's asking in our ILD room clinic, we see patients with high titer ACPA, UIP, but no joint manifestations of RA, even at long-term follow-up. Would you be, would you think it's reasonable to call them RA ILD? They have no joint symptoms. Um, I... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm on the, uh, you definitely worry about RA. Um, you know, you know, certainly you probably wouldn't treat them with DMARDs, at least now with the data we have, um, you know, um, you know, we've been very interested in ACPA sort of pre-RA, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're part of the stop RA study and, you know, interested to kind of phenotype that data set for lung involvement as well as an aside. Um, I think you would call those pre-RA, ILD, I guess, um, yeah. and that you'd really want to monitor them closely, but I probably wouldn't treat them with DMARDs. Um, and you you wonder how the treatment for IPF might influence their progression to lung disease or to art, uh, articular disease as well. Um, but yeah, that's a very interesting group. And certainly not everyone does progress to RA even with lung follow-up. So it's kind of interesting to see why they had a different trajectory, you know, the, the school teaching should be that this should settle in their joints, but it seems there's some people where it, it kind of never does. Yeah. A Bernard's comment to that is like similar to scleroderma, sine scleroderma, uh, I guess. Um, but in terms of a next question, I have uh, uh, curious about how you approach biologics in RA patients who have subclinical ILD, incidentally noted, or very mild symptoms. Do you change from a TNF to something more lung signal-like, like rituximab, abatacept, or continue to just monitor them on arthritis-targeted therapies and monitor? So I guess some of yeah. this was in the ILD guidelines as well. <laughs> yeah, this is definitely, um, you know, I wish we had better data. Um, you know, TNFs are getting also a kind of makeover as well. You know, I think there'd been a lot of um, worry about pulmonary signals in these patients, and there might be some reassuring data lately. Having said that, um, at the moment, at least, I, you know, in someone that has ILD, it, it is tempting to bypass the TNF for another agent like TOSI, which is obviously approved in systemic sclerosis ILD or abatacept which seems to have positive lung signals. Um, you know, pre-COVID, I might have thought about rituximab. Mm -hmm. I think now I'm really still reserving that. Um, so, um, you know, it kind of depends on the patient, but I do think it might be reasonable to skip TNF in some of these patients. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Venners, uh, one more question, maybe this, th we'll make it the last question. Um, okay. 
is HLA-DR shared epitope a risk factor for RA-ILD above the risk for <laughs> RA? Actually, the meeting I was at just prior to this, mm -hmm. um, we're carving out several research studies. And I don't have the answer at the moment, I, I hate to say. But within the COPD gene study, you know, they do have HLA typed on everyone. And the nice thing is we have quantitative CT. So, you know, to find a signal between a blunt, you know, ILD present yes, no is a little hard. So we're hoping that the QCT might um, give us more power to find a modest association. And then the other study that we're planning right now is related to RA phenotypes in the MGB Biobank, where we've constructed RA genetic risk scores including um, HLA genetic risk scores. Um, so we, of course, would expect them to be strongly associated with seropositivity, but to my knowledge, at least, it hasn't been looked at for RAILD. And so we do have all the adjudicated cases and controls that I've mentioned before. Um, so we'll definitely have that before ACR, maybe even for ULAR. So that's those are things that we're working on at the moment. So uh, I apologize, I don't have the answer quite yet. We'll stay tuned. In April, I see you in person, yeah. Yes, um, yeah, no, again, fantastic. Thank you so much. And yeah. congratulations on all this body of work. This is amazing. Thanks again for having me. And good luck in the college football playoffs. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Have all a right. great Bye. day.